People talk about the need to tear down walls, but maybe there's more of a need to build bridges, and there are people who are doing it in their own special way. We're gonna meet some of them in this program. People who are confronting differences in their everyday lives, and they are gonna to talk to us about change and how change occurs. We've all changed in some way, haven't we? I'll bet it's going to stir up a lot of memories. It'll certainly provoke dialogue. So come on this journey with me. We'll go into the homes and lives of people who are confronting differences in an everyday way, and we're going to go behind closed and locked doors and take a peek inside to see how people are crossing cultures and changing lives. Come on. Yvonne Odom and Paula Adams came through the fire of the early desegregation days in the 1960s in Delray Beach. Their paths have not crossed again until now as they share memories and search for a bridge across racial lines. And I remember at the end of the day, I asked if she wanted to share my locker, which she did. They had instructed me that they were not gonna put me in a PE class. And uh, those of you who know me, I'm very athletic, and that kind of devastated me. And I did tolerate it for one semester. But uh, like I said, I think the adults fear things that just didn't take place. Now, I don't remember uh, Paula by name, but I do remember the young lady who escorted me around. I remember it because it had to have been a huge, huge event for Yvonne, for Delray Beach, for our high school, certainly. I was just a part of it. I remember it because I'm embarrassed to think that it didn't mean more to me than it did, that I, that I was nothing more than a tour guide in my mind. It should have been much more special to me. It was, but I think Back then, it seems like a thousand years ago, we were socially unconscious. Life is a journey of rough roads and dark valleys, so we look for a covered bridge to walk on when the hard rains fall. That may take the form of faith, in religion, or in science, but both are actively wrestling with the same dilemma. How do you deal with race in an enlightened way? People are raised religiously through their culture that they usually accept the religion of their parents. So along that, would, if their parents were against integration or if their parents were segregationists, that just sort of came along. Because as you know, Kitty, we can have the Bible say anything we want it to say. A, you know, an educated scholar can find anything in the Bible. I believe, you know, that religion is ultimately here to heal to heal all people. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say only the nation of Israel. He didn't say only the white nation. He didn't say only the rich nation. He said, go and teach what I have taught you to all nations. And so what has he taught? He taught love, acceptance, non-judgment, forgiveness, and healing. This time in history, we need a huge dose of love, acceptance, forgiveness, non-judgment, and healing. Here we are in some 54 years after Dr. King got involved in the civil rights movement, and still, right now, 11 o'clock on Sunday, is the most segregated hour of our country. Unfortunately, what we are in this country now is a lot of us and them. There's, on every issue, there's us and them. We're right and they're wrong. And I think really, as I step back and look, we're more of a country of purple than either red or blue. The divisive issues which tear us apart don't affect us all. And I think if we focus on the issues that affect all of us, then we can unite as a country. Sit a spell on the river on the North Fork of the Old New River, a hidden treasure in Fort Lauderdale's oldest black community. Segregation kept it apart from the mainstream for decades and in a primitive state. 
but that will soon change. Eventually, with redevelopment, the river will link with tourism industry, with the intercoastal, with the ocean, with change. But for now, sit a spell with lifelong friends Sonny Porter and Mickey Hinton, who grew up on the river. On the Porter family property, which has survived since the 1940s, they keep its history alive as a part of what old Fort Lauderdale used to be. Better with Sonny and I, when we were together, you know, and he, in this city, you know, he was also a paper boy, and I was a little right-hand man. So you've and gotten, yeah, so you've gotten around each other so for much. years. And yeah. my life, you know, come and visit yeah. Sonny now, and my had a little dog named Ronnie, and he ran all the way out, didn't he, Sonny? Yeah. Pulled the feet, you know, worn out, following the truck. But we're having so much fun to come out here for our first time and be with Sonny now, and we was getting a little, Ragged the boat and go down and play in the water, but we had to be very careful for it. Sonny could swim much better than I could. We and I and Sonny and I, you know, we knew where we had to go and where we could go. And so we did abide by that as little kids. So the only thing we basically did was stay in our places and did what we had to do and enjoy what we had and work with the things that we had. And so we got on real good as far as the race part was in Fort Lauderdale because, you know, it's a lot of things that we can talk about, but in the days that being in Dixie Coat Project, just for the audience, Dixie Coat Project was one of the most safest neighborhood for blacks uh, that we know about in the whole state of Florida. The richest the neighborhood. Richest, That's where the richest the, people stay. Because see, when they built it, everybody think, oh, I lived in the project, so you had to be poor to live in the project. But the principal of Dillard High School, Mr. Mosley lived in the project. Our fourth grade teacher, Ms. Nicholas, was there. We had so many teachers, and everybody living in the project. I was probably like four years old at my grandfather's house in North Carolina, and I was watching the show Different Strokes, which is about uh, two black children that are raised in a white family. I used to love the show, and I was watching it. My grandfather came in, and he got real angry and said, turn off that show with them damn colored folks. You know, that's, not, that's not allowed in this household. And at that age, I didn't really know what was wrong with it. Mr. Dalfit was the school janitor at our school, and he was the nicest, most loving guy in the world. All the kids loved him. We all adored him. And he lived on Settlement Road, which was very close to my house. It was a very poor um, road, dirt road, um, and it's where the black people, some black people lived. And I just remember um, just the big difference between that, like how he could go to school, how everybody could love him and stuff, and then yet they were living down there and they were almost shunned to an extent by my parents and by other people. When I was young, I was probably in first or second grade, and I wanted to have over one of my friends, and, I, and we were, he was going to come over for a sleepover, and uh, I told my mom that he was black, and it wasn't allowed. And it took me years to actually figure that one out. I think everybody in my family would say that they're not racist. Um, however, you can hear the racist remarks in a very subtle, slight way. I feel like I I can try to teach them as best as I can, but they, you know, you can't teach a person any of this stuff. They've really got to come to these awarenesses on their own. Now they will deny, my brothers, my dad will deny up and down that they're not racist, yet they'll let the N-word slip out here and there, and it's like, well, how can you, you know, how can you say that? Listen to the way you're talking. Therein lies the racism that's embedded within people. It's like the sins of the fathers get passed on to the children. So how do you break the cycle? <laughs> just make different choices. You just, you flat out make different choices with people. Um, you just make different choices. <laughs> Ed Gerwitz grew up in New York. His wife, Maddie, is from a small town in Georgia. In 35 years of marriage, the couple has dealt with family issues, racial matters, and major social change. If we went down to Greenwich Village, there was no problem. People kind of look at you, but they didn't bother you or nothing. We went uptown 
to the east side, to the 80s, which today is probably a very avant-garde and you have a lot of interracial couples. In those days, no, you, you would get looks, you would get stares. Nobody ever said anything that I could recall, but I know certain places that were not happy if we showed up together to go into. Yeah. Uh, theaters and stuff, they kind of look at you as, you know, what, what are you doing away. here? Or walk away, you know, people would. And I know my, eventually my parents dropped some of their friends because they would not invite us to their house and they wouldn't invite my parents anymore to their house. From Maddie's side of the family, I never had any, any no problem. problems whatsoever. I think the cocoa butter was probably, the cocoa butter that the, the blacks use, and this is some, some colognes and stuff. I think it was more for me was dietary. I mean, some of the food. I don't eat pork. And my wife would, and I eat kosher meat only. So my wife would cook, you know, for me, the, the kosher stuff. And I got to eventually enjoy collard greens and stuff. I would never have eaten it before. And grits became a, a novelty uh, type of, uh, of food for me. How, how uh, receptive was your son when you first got married? Oh, he didn't want it at all. But then after he went on and he learned to love my husband very much, he called him pop. I, I could still think and feel that, you know, somewhat was, how do you explain this man? And he would explain me as his stepfather was the easiest. My grandchildren, as far as I know, don't use that uh, term. And my great grandkids, well, the oldest one is, as I say, is Randy Six. I don't think he understands it. Listen to Raid Khan. When I look at where we were and where we were going, it was all good till our leaders started showing. Lack of interest, we've been missed long enough, it's time to invest in us. So I'm going to lay it out and try not to show you the violence. Listen to Khan's unique perspective on poetry. Well, I am Muslim and my religion is Islam, so uh, a lot of my poetry and my work uh, are inspired from this. Or they, um, a lot of my writings come from my surroundings and my religion. And basically when I write, I kind of tell my story of what's going on around me and my surroundings. Um, and the message that I, I send is a universal message of peace, of love, unity, harmony, all that contained inside the poetry. There is a lot of misconceptions about Islam, especially what's portrayed in the media. And, you know, through my actions, the way I carry myself and how I speak and present my poetry, all reflect Islam and myself. And um, in the media, Islam is not portrayed very well. And by doing this poetry, I'm hoping to, you know, try to break what the people see on television and show them what it really is, what it's really like to see a live Muslim practicing, living everyday life, uh, going to school, I mean, on campus, that's what I'm trying to do. And through my actions and how I carry myself, you know, people will see what true Islam is. This poem is entitled, Speech. I'm speaking with spoken word. Speechless when I speak and outspoken when I'm heard. A speaker seeking out verbs and sneakers putting together words. Making a name for myself and causing an uproar in this world. Generating a silent movement. Moving with vibrant students. With potent poetry with content. The kind that's not so complex that it conflicts with the intellect. I hope you can comprehend it's for the competent and the ones with common sense. Not necessarily for common men. You know, as I get more deeply involved into the spoken word poetry, you know, I want to go to a place where uh, Muslim, a Muslim hasn't been in terms of the spoken word. Fear still grips me sometimes just before I knock on the door of people who have agreed to an oral history interview for the historical archives. You never know what kind of memories are going to be unlocked and how painful they may be to hear. Talking about race can be difficult, but people can surprise you too. And I'll tell you what, every time I leave one of those houses, I know I'll remember that story for a long, long time. Join me next time for another episode of Crossing Cultures, Changing Lives, and Meanwhile, you keep sharing your stories, your stories, your stories, your stories, your stories too.